Uh, first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I want to hear a little bit of uh, who you are. And uh, so when we go through the evening and I tell you all this stuff that we're doing at Mortensen, that you can get an idea where it's coming from, and then I can get an idea maybe what kind of questions you would have or some of the things you'd like to know about, and I'll do the best I can to answer and, and to give you some insight into what our company is doing. Uh, first of all, um, it's great to be a Minnesotan in this time. Um, my wife and I were born and raised in southern Minnesota and southwestern Minnesota. Doug and I were talking a little bit. I don't know why it is, and I've, I've often tried to wonder why I had this sort of bent towards making sure that environmental quality could go hand in hand with economic viability. And when I was in high school and college, um, I was very environmentally aware. Um, and, and then went, when I went, I went to St. John's for my undergrad in the University of Wisconsin for my graduates, graduate work, all the while focusing on what, I, what was known then as environmental pollution. <clears throat> um, over the past years, I've been in various aspects of the environment and for the last 10 years or so in renewable energy. And I think what happened growing up in, at home and in Minnesota informed me somehow the importance that we can actually do this, which is we can find economic vitality and viability by using energy sources that are renewable. And I am very pleased to be a part of a company that shares really that same, that same lineage and that, that same heritage and that same desire. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. But meeting a few of you before the meeting, can you just kind of let me know where you are in the solar space? I mean, how many of you are installers or integrators? Would you call yourselves that? Okay, maybe five, five out of 30 or so. Okay, how many, give, just kind of shout out what type of work you do in the solar space. Uh, at, uh, um, supply chain? Okay, um, anybody? Design and sales. Design, okay. Policy. Policy development. Manufacturing. Okay. <clears throat> Structural engineering. Okay, for the frames, okay. And what about students, do we have any students? Okay, and what are you studying? I'm a law and business student at the U. Okay. I'm a second year MBA at the US. Okay, good. Okay. You're looking at me. Anything you want to add? <laughs> I just want to add public policy. Yeah. Okay. But not me. That's cool. This lady next to me. No. I'd like to introduce Mary Brindle for Edina City Council. Oh, very good. Nice to meet you. Well, Welcome. You. Well, and, and I appreciate being asked to, to come here and talk tonight. So now that I know who you are, you know who I am, let me talk a little bit who this company called Mortensen is. Um, <clears throat> again, I feel very fortunate to be a part of something that's growing and to be a part of an organization that is truly led by reputable people. Um, I think some of you could probably agree that if you work your career and you work with a bunch of schmucks, that it, boy, it takes a long time to get through your career. And um, working with uh, this, this family and this company is, is just the opposite. We have, uh, Mortensen has been a company since uh, 1957. And in that time, we have grown to do lots of different things in the United States, Canada, and building um, uh, across the world. So when, I, when you think of Mortensen, I want you to think of, in this, in this framework, I want you to think of us as builders. <clears throat> and hopefully visionary builders, but let's just consider us builders. And so tonight I want to tell you a little bit about where, where the company is, what we do as a company, and then kind of start focusing down on the renewal, the energy side of what we're doing, and then focus even deeper into the, the, the solar work that we're doing. And, and as I, I titled this utility scale solar, <clears throat> we, don't, we don't do a lot of smaller projects in solar, and we, we really haven't built any rooftops of any size, but 
as we go and we learn and, and we get more comfortable with some of the rooftop stuff, we're probably building some rooftops and carports and we can talk about that and maybe even you know, work with some of you folks in doing that. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty casual and informal, so if you have questions, just shout it out or say something. So let's just, let's just have some fun. I can get this to move. I don't see, I don't know if, can you read that okay? Um, just to give you an idea of the type of markets that we're in, the, the green, the 28% is a power market. And this is, this is the type of buildings that Mortensen builds. So when you look at this pie chart, you can see um, the light blue is hotels. Then you can go the purple education as, as you go around clockwise, the sports facilities and around there. So you get the idea that a large portion of our revenue comes from power. And right now, Mortensen is the 11th largest power contractor in the United States. But what really differentiates us is that all of the power that we build is renewable. So we're the top one in the top 20 contractors are the only ones that are building all 100% renewable energy in our power portfolio. So that's that's a little, and that's right here at home. I mean, you guys can be proud of that. We're right here. Um, so in 95, we started building wind power facilities, and that's really kind of a, a glorious term for one wind turbine in the middle of a cornfield in Adair, Iowa. I mean, that's true. That's a fellow on our, on our team, Jerry, Jerry uh, Gruntner, <clears throat> was approached by one of our customers and he said, hey, can you guys build a, a windmill? And he said, well, why do you want to build a windmill? And he said, well, can, could you build us a windmill? There's a new wind turbine that we'd like to, we'd like to try and we want you to build it. And he said, yeah, we can figure that out. And, and from that beginning, 16 years later, we're in engineering news record in this last version, we're number one in North America in building wind energy facilities. So to date, we build 124 of these projects, totaling 13,094 megawatts. So that's 13 gigawatts of, of wind energy on the ground in the United States and Canada. That's a pretty big number. That's a, that's a lot of wind farms. <clears throat> and then because of that experience and because of that familiarity in the market, we expanded into solar. And that's kind of where I came in. Now, there, I did put a couple brochures out there if you want to take something home. But this, this little map I like because in it, it shows the various states. And the numbers are the numbers of megawatts, megawatts. And the color coded are, you know, basically how much of the uh, wind or solar facility in megawatts did we build in those states or provinces. And you can see from the map that, you know, we've been pretty active um, around the U.S. and Canada. And then those little sunburst deals, the orange ones are the solar projects that we've built. And the yellow ones are the ones that we're currently building now. And uh, we have two projects here in Southern California for a total of 25 megawatts on one site um, that we're building currently. And then the other yellow sunburst is a Tucson, Arizona site, a five megawatt plant that we're currently building. And then over in North Carolina, Carolina, we're starting our fourth plant over in North Carolina. That's a 2.4 2 megawatt plant. They're all ground mount, all PV. And I, and I brought some pictures to show you. Yeah, Richard. I was going to ask, um, is there any reason why there's so much in North Carolina that just goes to policy? Yes, it's, it's policy, yes. They have uh, accelerated depreciation over there, and then they also have some fast-track projects through Progress Energy and Duke Energy. So if you're under, you know, if you're two and a half megawatts or so, then they get a fast-track permitting process. And uh, so they can get some pretty favorable rates, you know, plus your investment tax credit and, and some of the other things that are uh, operating. So the state's RPSs, you know, the Renewable Portfolio Standards, do make a big difference and they drive the work that we're doing in a lot of ways. More, more like, your, like your work. I mean, you know, we're all kind of driven by policy. 
So <clears throat> that just gives you kind of an overview of what we've done uh, nationwide and in the provinces. I, I brought a, a couple wind energy projects to, to talk to you about, and just to give you an idea of kind of the scope. And um, how many of you have seen some pretty large wind farms? Okay, everybody, all right. How many of you have been to Palm Springs and seen this wind farm? Okay. If you ever, if you ever get a chance uh, to go out to Palm Springs, hopefully during the winter, but the, the Mountain View project in Palm Springs is actually, it's kind of a museum of wind energy. They have the old, you know, the old Derrick style uh, windmills and then they go up to the smaller turbines and the larger turbines. And um, it's just fascinating. What, what it is, it's a, it's a place where the mountains come down from the desert and it, and it has kind of this, this valley where this vortex is. So the wind comes whooshing down and then comes into this valley and it's a terrific wind resource. But it's, it's amazing and we've built, you know, uh, quite a few of these. Uh, we just put this 49 megawatt Mountain View project in um, and we added, you know, one, one megawatt Mitsubishi turbines on this one. Uh, we did the full engineering procurement and construction of that. This is a, this is a big one. This is the Rolling Hills Wind Project by Mid-American Energy. And this 400, almost 444 megawatt project in Iowa. Um, it was interesting because it's coincided with our 100th wind project. So you can imagine that was a lot of fun, celebrating a 100th project and, and the largest project out there. Um, the project spanned about 150 miles, 150 square miles over four counties. So that also gives you a little bit of a view of the scope of the wind work that we're doing and have done. Interesting, the, you notice the size of the turbines too? A 2.3 megawatt Siemens turbines. Basically now we're building two and a half megawatt turbines and we even have some three megawatt turbines that we're putting up. So the industry has expanded and grown just like, um, just like others have. And then also this is the 300 megawatt Cedar Creek um, project in a 120 square mile site in Colorado. And this one is um, good for us to, to kind of highlight because this is not only completed on time and budget, but not one lost time incident on site. And for those of you that are in the construction world and, and building things, that's a remarkable accomplishment. Safety is, is number one for us. We have a a zero injury policy at Mortensen overall. And zero injury means just that as we strive for zero injuries. And um, when we accomplish it, it's really quite something. We're very proud of that. Any questions? <clears throat> yes? Just about the birds and the nature, you know, has there been much, I mean, these are quite, quite desolate areas that yeah. That, that's, that's a good question. The question was, have we, as Mortensen, done any natural resource impacts on birds and bats and things like that? And, and our company, again, think of us as builders. So a developer would come to us and they'd say, we want to build this you know, 100 megawatt project here on, on the mountain. And uh, you tell us how to do it. You form the foundations, you do the erection, you do the placements of the turbine, you do all the electrical, you figure it out. And we say, do you have your permits? And it's up to them to get their permits. But what we have seen is that <clears throat> the majority of the locations that we do put our facilities in are extremely remote. And, and there usually isn't an, isn't an issue. But we did work in West Virginia. And we put up, a, I think it was a, a Smoky Mountain, I think it was called. We put up a, a system and there, and there were um, bats that had kind of migrated near this area. And so, you know, that was a big deal because we had to make sure that everything was permitted and in place before we built. But typically that, that responsibility and scope is with others. Um, you don't know, it's nice to know that because <coughs> in areas, there's a lot of that in this country. Mm -hmm. That could happen more extensively. Well, that's one of the pushbacks. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know, people say that about wind farms. How many birds and other animals and ecosystems are endangered by coal, yeah. gas, fracking, and oil? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. There's no comparison. Yeah. Just recently, I came across my desk, I didn't save it, but there was a little article about a, a bird kill study in North Dakota. And the number of bird kills that they attribute to the wind towers was smaller than the number they attributed to feral cats and, the, yeah. <laughs> and their cars and stuff like that. It wasn't a very big number at all. Mm -hmm. so, that's a re very recent study that came out a couple of weeks ago. I, I always, and, and I, um, you know, I'm an environmental scientist by training, and I always look at these things as kind of this risk mitigation, you know, and comparing risk, because we don't, we live in a risk, you know, our world is risk, and we have to measure the risk. I empathize with people that are concerned about that, and I think it's good to have good science to, to inform you on what the real issues are, but then when it comes down to it, you have to, you know, balance that out and weigh it out. And, um, you know, I think from our standpoint as builders, we, we try to make sure that we leave as little a footprint as possible when we go onto these sites. And then on top of it, we have a culture of giving back to the community. So for instance, when we would bring our foremen and project managers and superintendents to a site, we hired local craft to, to build, you know, lo local labor to build our, our uh, operations, both solar and, and wind. And typically what happens is that obviously you get quite a, quite a construction crew that comes into these small remote areas and it can be a tremendous boon to the economy in, in some of these sites. And then you can't help but, you know, get to know the local people. And more often than not, in fact, I will say in almost every situation where we work in, in these different communities, we end up contributing something to the community where they end up, you know, saying, boy, you know, it was really a great experience having Mortensen here. You know, you helped us with the fundraiser, you helped us with the food drive. There's just a, a, an article in our, in our local news that one of our, on one of our wind projects, the owner's rep, not, not a Mortensen employee, but the owner's rep had a dog that got killed doing something. We didn't run it over, that was a good thing, but <laughs> as one of, our, one of our foremen had gotten to know this owner's rep and went and to the pound and found a dog, a puppy, that was the same breed as the one this guy lost. Apparently this guy really loved his dog and, and bought him uh, this dog and gave him a puppy and the guy was just like, this is the nicest thing that you would do this. And, you know, and the, the guy that did it was just, yeah, well, it just, it felt like the right thing to do. And, you know, we got a lot of people like that, not just our company, but, you know, when people treat people de decently, they want you back, and they want you back in the community, and that's a big deal for us. So we take that very seriously. Of course, then you know about Target Field. I want a little bit of our commercial project experience. So we've built some really cool stadiums and some really cool concert halls and some really cool hotels and hospitals all around the country. And hopefully we're gonna build a really cool Viking stadium too, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But the interesting part about Target Field for me is, you know, it's an eight acre site that's at the convergence of light rail, the North Star computer, commuter line, the bike trail, the interstate, and the railroad. And it's all LEED certified, green certified, and then also it has the water and, and uh, stormwater reclamation system under the field. And all of this was new and, and we were a part of not coming up with those ideas but making sure that they got built properly on time and on budget. And this stadium again was on time and on under budget. And that makes a big deal when you're talking about this kind of money. Only missing solar collectors. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Well, I think we can retrofit, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, let, let's uh, talk a little bit about our solar experience. Um, so about four and a half, almost five years ago, our Mortensen's 
um, Mortensen Construction's renewable energy interest was only wind and a little bit of biofuels. We had done a little work in ethanol, and as we started taking a look at the ethanol play, we kind of moved back from that because we didn't see it being sustainable at that time. We're still following the second and third generation cellulosic ethanol to help build these ethanol plants and biobutanol and you know, some of the other cool things that are happening in the biofuels. Also biomass, you know, we're interested in building biomass plants, but the, the solar market was starting to kind of take off, so we latched onto that about four and a half years ago. And, and since then, we've built some pretty interesting arrays from a utility side of things. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this one. This is a 30 megawatt plant. This obviously is an aerial view. I've got a couple other pictures for you. But this technology is a concentrated photovoltaic CPV technology. Do you know what CPV is? Okay. Well, this is the Aminex technology. We built a small array for Aminex, a 13 pedestal array at a solar technology acceleration center in Aurora, Colorado. And after we did that, then we came to Cogentrix, the developer here, and said, you know, we'd like to build your big one. And so this was 30 megawatts. This is 512 of these, these big pedestals. And they have these masts that are 40 feet by 70 feet masts that, that contain the, the concentrated PV on them. I have, I have a photo. So this is, this is part of the erection process. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it kind of looks like a wind farm erection. I mean, you know, we treated it as such. So we did as much subassembly as we could do on the ground, and then we, we elevated, and then we mounted on the pedestals this big mast. And, and you got to be careful. It's not too windy. <laughs> so what we saw, okay, so what we're seeing there, oh, I see. Some of them are flat. Yeah. They have the, a pedestal beneath them. Correct. Okay. Yeah, these are, these are, the whole solar field is built, and, and uh, it hasn't been commissioned. So some of them are sleeping, and some of them are, are, are not. Oh, but they all have the pedestal. Yep, yep. So they're all, they're all built with the pedestal, and then the mast is on top. And, and the interesting feature of these is that they're dual axis tracked. So you know they follow east and west, and then the, the uh, latitude in the, in the That's sky. Right. Uh, on that subject, yes. The <coughs> Cost analysis, the extra cost of moving them around versus just leaving them facing, you know, south. How did that break out as far as the cost? I mean, do you in, involve <clears throat> that part? Or? No. In this project, the owner, Cogentrix, the developer and owner of it, said that they, they had a power purchase agreement that had requirements in the agreement that would allow them to gain more by having this thing tracked which is kind of the benefits of having even a single access tracker if you have time of day requirements yep. in your PPA. And this technology is really um, interesting though in that CPV technology has to be totally perpendicular with the sun, totally. So that if you don't have a perpendicular plane where, that, where those photons are hitting like right perpendicular, off to yeah, if it's off, it's shot because the Fresnel lens focuses everything onto that little cell in there. So they have to have dual access or else that technology is just worthless. And so the CPV technology is almost always mated with the dual access tracking or else it doesn't work. And it has to be in, in areas where there's a tremendous, you know, five, 355 plus days a year of sun. Both of those companies are very good. And you said it, but I want to reemphasize it. Trackers have value when you have to, in your PPA, you have to meet an afternoon load. Mm -hmm. And if you face south, you get maximum power. But if you, if you track the sun, you can, you can emphasize your afternoon power yeah. so that you get uh, your maximum value out of your PPA. Right. And, and a lot of times there's kickers in these PPAs. Well, if you have a time of day kicker where you get two and a half or two times the amount of money for that power, you're going to want to make darn sure you get it oriented properly at that time of day. So that's part of the driver. Yes? How far away is that from any place where they use the power? Uh, it's a good question. That's a good question. This is in Alamosa, Colorado. Um, 
so and it and it's in in a it was in Excel's neighborhood. So you know we have a substation up there, so they pump it into a substation that got got distributed. So I don't think it's very far. Um, but on that on that line, what we've done in our in our solar group is we made sure now that we can self perform every aspect of the plant. We do all the all the electrical. We build the T lines, the substation. We we mount everything. We've even put in posts. The only thing we don't do is fencing because fencing contractors can do that better, faster, cheaper. Steve, yes. Does, does Martinson ever take on maintenance contracts for these systems? Um, no. Do you know what's all involved there? Yes, we we would arrange for O and M, and have um, and usually work it out in our bids with our with the developers, if they want us as the EPC, the engineering procurement and construction contractor, to arrange for O and M, we would, but then it ends up being a separate contract. But it would, it would the O and M would work through us, and 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 then we could you know segregate it out, whichever makes most sense. But we don't feel we're very, um, what we like to do is we like to build it, we like to test it, we like to prove that it works, and then we like to turn the keys over and, and build another one. Um, behind the fence, yes, Lucas. I'm just curious, how, uh, how efficient are those uh, panels that you're talking about here? They're, you know, if we're, if we're looking at a, a, a thin film at about 19% at the most, we're looking at a crystalline silicon of 20, 22 maybe at the most, these things are 35 35 percent efficient and and that's the only saving grace really is that once you get them oriented properly you get them in the right spot this is the high Alamosa Colorado if you've been there it's a high plains it's very very sunny but you get them oriented properly in a high irradiance you know location and the trackers work and they're very relatively efficient so 30 plus percent efficiency yeah So the question is, has there been any research done on the cost of construction plus not, not the cost. Oh, oh, the, the cost of energy in construction? Is that what you're saying? The, cost, the, amount. the amount of energy in construction, well, obviously no. <laughs> Put it this way, let me tell you one thing that's happened to us in the last couple of weeks. We have been uh, requested to provide a greenhouse gas emission report card for our projects, which will put us to the place where we'll probably have to do that. So, you know, how many vehicles are you using? You know, how much, how much uh, electricity in our build out and that sort of thing. So, yeah, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, LA Crystalline uh, has the highest uh, carbon footprint. Um, the embedded carbon, which I think is what you're asking about, Charlie, um, is taken care of after three years Yeah, that's true. Yes. A developer. And in fact, it was a developer from Spain because under Kyoto and, and some of the tracking that they're already forced to do, they bring that to the US, which I think is probably a good thing. But just we haven't seen it before. Yes. This is a two part question. <clears throat> Are you concerned about the uh, reported conclusion of the federal tax credits available to individuals or corporations who install renewable energy uh, products or sources 
And second, are you also concerned about the new tariffs that are being imposed on China because of their cost structure and cheating? Um, is that going to put a dent, one or both of those, in your business plans, future business? So the first one is uh, ITC investment tax credits or other tax incentives. Are we concerned if they go away? Pardon me. Production tax credit. Yeah, but but for solar, it's the investment. It's the ITC until 216, and we're okay. We what we think is that within a couple of years that there's going to be probably some pretty strong cases for grid parity in in several states. That, that solar would probably be able to stand on its own. But we don't want to see that incentive be removed now because it, we're not ready for it. That, so that's my answer on that one. The second one is even more fascinating because we have a lot of companies that we work with that are Chinese and others that, are, that work with that are German and those that we work with that are domestic. And this, this countervailing duty claim tariff issue with the Chinese has, you know, really rocked the solar industry. Um, however, in, in terms of being afraid or, or concerned about pricing, I'm not. And the reason I'm not is, and, it, and I think it kind of what Lynn almost started to allude to is that there's so much advancements going on in this field that we're seeing new, new methods, new approaches, new technologies come out every month almost if you're reading these, these solar rags. I mean, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And in talking to the Chinese um, people, the Chinese distributors here, they're saying, no, nah, don't, don't worry about the tariffs. You know, we can absorb them. Um, and we'll see how all that goes. But we're, again, the lens that I started out with at the very beginning, we're builders. And, and just like Jack, just like you, I mean, you get in your, your supply chain and you have different, you know, combiner boxes from different people, different cables, different trays from others, and you say, I'm going to pick the best one I can for the price. Well, there's a lot of competition, and I think that's good. And I think that's helping our industry. But boy, a couple, when, when at Solar Power International, not this year, but the last, when they announced the solar world uh, foist against the Chinese, it was, it was pretty amazing because it really rocked the industry. So I think, I think the good thing is, is that there's another good thing that's happening. And this may sound kind of weird, but it's really scrubbing out the, the ones in the industry that can't survive, right? And what's happening there is making the companies that can survive stronger and better. And it was so, so cloudy. They claim that there's going to be um, about 180 um, Chinese module manufacturers that will go out of business. 180 go out of business. So, so what were they doing in business? OK, and, and so that's happening. And, and that's the market. And that's sorting itself out. We figure 2013 is going to be a year of sorting out, but after that, we think that the ones that are going to survive are the ones that are going to be building and, and doing pretty well. So not afraid of that. Um, <clears throat> this project here was an interesting one. This was built with thin film technology. This was the first solar modules we put in at a healthcare clinic in New Jersey. It's uh, 1.8 megawatts, and it, there's about 25,000 thin film modules that are producing about half of the, the, their electrical load for this healthcare clinic. And so that was a kind of a fun project in New Jersey. This is, Can yes? I ask, was your, is the thin film modules working out well? It's mm -hmm. not the cutting edge, but the ragged edge. <laughs> as, far, as far as we know, they are. Um, like I said, what we want to do is have a good install, no repeats, um, under, under budget and on time. And then when we turn the keys over, the thing works, and it works well. And so that was the condition for this plant. Um, I can't tell you, because we only follow one facility right now. 
where we have access to the output. And we'll be doing that more in the future so we can answer questions like that. But as far as I know, it's still going fine. Excuse me. Um, yeah. So you guys are involved in a, in a project like a health center or a, an engine facility. Do you get involved in the actual, in the sales pr proposal phase when they're going to that company or are you more in afterwards where you're bidding against other installers for the actual installer? It, it would be, well, it's kind of, I, I'm going to use a little different terminology and, and kind of explain how we operate in this space because if a developer has a project and let's say an exco was a developer, now EDF Renewables, and Exco is a Spanish developer that we helped get into the wind business actually here in the United States, and they're one of the largest wind developers now in the country. When they put an RFP on the street that said, we want to build a solar plant in Bellmead, New Jersey at this clinic, it's going to be a behind the fence project, which means the power coming from the array doesn't go to the grid, it goes into a host facility and then they can sell excess if they want. And so then we, the way the market is, we as Mortensen competitively bid that project. So we would bid the engineering, the procurement, the construction of that project, or just act as a general contractor depending upon what it, what it entailed. So they already had the, the modules, the panels, so we didn't have to buy those, but then we put pricing in for what it would take to buy the rest and to build it. And so we won it on a competitive basis. So does that answer your question, kind of how we operate? Yeah, but and so the, they had already sold the project to the health center. Right? Correct. Yeah, and yeah. you're competing against three or four other installers. Right, so yeah. that's, that's right. So that's not, we're not playing in that space yeah. because in a, in a large sense, if we did that, we'd kind of be competing against our customers. So if we would go out and, and but it, you know, and, and sometimes we're very, very close to the very beginning of these projects where we, hit, we have projects right now, we just bid into a, a sun power project out in, out in um, uh, California of 700 megawatts. We bid into that and it's, it's going good. So we'll, we'll You're see. Involved in the we were involved from the very, very beginning. beginning. Yeah. And to me, I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to be there early, and you have to know the people. You have to know what they require, and then hopefully come in with a good price and, and always, always, always have your supply chain refreshed so you know what pricing is and what quality is and that sort of thing. So I hope, I hope I'm not boring you, but that's... Okay, so this is, a, this is a small little install here for GE Aviation, and this is, we use their... GE's thin film pro product, and we put it in at this site. And this, uh, this is the aviation facility in Durham, and we also use their inverters and their monitoring system. This is GE's first install. So you know GE and how they move on things, so they want to do it all, and they want to learn the business. And so Mortensen is in that space early on, like I told you, with GE and helping them kind of get their product out there. Excuse me, uh, regarding GE, they have an office here in town, GE Power and Water. Are they involved with all in their solar aspects? I don't think so. Okay. And, and that's another thing I have to, I have to say, even though I'm, I'm from here and I live here, um, the majority of work that we do is not here. You know, I'll show you a project we did with Westwood Professional Services we're very proud of, but you know, the majority of the policy work that I do and the activities that, that you know, we as a company pursue are really far flung. And I'd love to do more here. You know, we, were, we knew about the Slayton project and, and with Ecos and, and all that. So you know, a, lot of them, a lot of them we get a chance to look at. Um, this is a Green Co. and this is a, a small sun power project which actually ends up getting us in position for this larger one. And that's why we wanted to get a five megawatt under our belt. And if, and if things go right, you know, to help them with 700, it's a whole different deal. But it, it gave us a familiarity with their technology. Um, and we put this, this little project in. Um, this is about a five megawatt project here in North Carolina. And this was the first, uh, the first time 
that we had our own people do the solar electrical on this. We did everything on this project. And so we self-performed for with Mortensen people on this project. And that was one of the conditions that SunPower put on their bids is that you as a contractor can't just be a general contractor and sub everything out. You have to bring some value to it. So we got into the self-perform. Uh, and then there's, you know, I, I put this in for maybe people that may not be familiar with some of the work that still goes on in the field. You know, you still, not everything is automated. There's still a lot of hand work that needs to be done. And in this case, there's a lot of um, equipment variability and a lot of um, technology improvements that we're seeing on racking and, and all these systems out in the field. I mean, just today again, we had another group come in to give us a new idea. And it's and the people are really thinking about it and they're trying to strip these costs out. Yes. Yeah, that's a single axis tracker. Yeah. Everybody, that rolls over. Sun gets up in the east, is facing the east, and rolls following the sun. <coughs> Do you, yeah, does everybody see that? Yeah. You, quick question. Why was this, why is the difference between the DC and the AC capacity this one? It's 6.4 megawatts and then 8 DC and then down to 5 for AC? Yeah, it's you. You you usually have a, a little uh, DC to AC conversion ratio of about 1.25 or 1.3. So you have a larger DC six and a half that ends up being AC above five. So that's a, that's what your ratio ends up being. And then there's a and I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that, but if the DC AC ratio is a big deal in the industry now because you can predict a plant being more efficient and have, have a higher um, AC ratio to your DC, but the, the, you gotta be a little bit careful because you have to predict if it's actually gonna work that way. So you can, you know, there, there's some, some messing around that people do in trying to figure out that ratio, but that's, that's a difference. Yes? On that, have you been held uh liable for performance of systems you put in, or is that on the developer? No, we, we, have, we have, we share some of that liability, but what we don't do is we don't guarantee the output at this point on our own. We have partners that are with us in that. You, but yes, we- Do you hire partners when you need to? Well, that yeah, that's essentially correct. Yeah. Do most of these large have that kind of experience? The larger, the, larger, the larger projects do now. The larger projects, the bankers want to see where they're guaranteed an output based on you know, the criteria that they're going to get this amount of energy out. And if they don't, then someone's going to pay liquidated damages. And so we don't want to do that. That's, that's kind of interesting that you said that because we, one, of our, one of our plants we finished in North Carolina in the U, on the O&M issue, we, we commissioned the, the plant and, and we cleaned up the site and everybody left and, and they were going through the commissioning and you know, it took a week or two and then a, a couple more weeks and they, it, was in, it was in North Carolina, it was very rainy and we had actual trees growing up through the racking. And so having coexisting with vegetation, you gotta be very careful what you're planting underneath these things because it could really mess it up. And you don't you don't want that. Okay, how are we doing, Doug? Okay. Um, yeah this is this is the plant. This is what we put in Trina modules on this site, um, so Chinese modules here. And we broke ground in January and completed the project in April. Um, and uh, we, we're building a companion to this right down the street. Um, this site, it, to me, was very interesting because they had a hurricane, a um, fire, 
and one other blight. I don't know if it was grasshoppers or locusts or something, but <laughs> they they had they had another they had another natural disaster, and and everything hung hung tight, and and it was you know what lasted through it. But you know some of these areas, they're not only the remote, but then they're also prone to you know different uh, types of uh, natural events. Uh, this that little solar tech one I told you about a little bit. That's the CPV technology. Okay, <clears throat> this is St. John's University. Um, working with Westwood Professional Services, at, and they, they were the developer and partner in this. We built St. John's University campus up here in, in Collegeville. Um, it's a single access tract array, and if you ever want to go up and see it, I don't know, it would be a great field trip. I'm sure that they would love to have you. And you can see this, and you can see the amount of production. What would be fun to do is to go up in the winter on one of those really sunny days that we have here. Uh, this thing produces like crazy. And, and it produces over nameplate, basically. So it, there, you know, it's really, really a good system. Um, <clears throat> the modules are silicon, S-I-L-I-K-E-N, modules that are put up here. And um, it, it produced lab, two Januaries ago, I guess, um, it produced almost half the, half the energy needed for the Abbey and the campus in January when the students were gone. <laughs> so, now Westwood, is that Nathan Franzen by chance? Yeah, Nathan, Nathan Franzen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, Nathan's a good friend, and yeah, okay. you, you know him from mm -hmm. Dinah. Okay, now I threw this in because <clears throat> you have PV, which we're all familiar with, but then there's also concentrated solar thermal or CSP, right? Concentrated solar power. And in CSP, you can have parabolic troughs or power towers or linear Fresnel, but you also have Stirling engines. And this is the largest array of Stirling engines um, in the world that we installed in Maricopa County, Peoria, Arizona for Tessera Solar North America and Stirling Energy. And these, this, this is really quite a Interesting story because these sun catchers are one and a half megawatts in, in production. That that's a real picture, and and they are so cool, but they're defunct. And let me let me explain this. And it, the, you can see on the end of that armature there. There's that little. Uh, it's the engine that's located. So the the parabola, the dish, focuses. The, the heat, so it's solar thermal, that focuses the heat of the sun onto a, um, a little receiver that ends up heating up hydrogen inside this four-cylinder engine, the Stirling engine. And the hydrogen, you know, <coughs> excites the, the pistons and it ends up creating um, a, a AC current. So you don't need any conversion, so that's, that's great, that's sweet. But hydrogen is really difficult to keep in control. It's the smallest element there is, and it leaks all over the place. And what else about hydrogen is important? It's flammable. So the danger of fire. So this, this, this uh, perturbation, this, this product is, was very well thought out, very well sourced for equipment, but it had the flaw in that it ran on hydrogen. And it just, they just couldn't make it. So I don't know how, it must have been maybe 18 months ago now, they actually ended, ended up having an auction. And so you can go and buy a dish like this. <laughs> and so people did, and then they had to remove it within so many hours of the site, 60 of these sun catchers. So it's really a shame, but it just shows you, I mean, simplicity, elegance, you know, quality and price, it's just all gotta be present. Great technology, it worked, worked famously. They worked very, very well, but there's just too many moving pieces. Yeah? I heard that there, I worked not on that particular one, I thought I had, but I worked on the next thing. And oh, sure. We got 35%. Oh, yeah. And it was great, but I didn't realize that we were talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Could they try to think of some other element they could use? 
As a matter of fact, yes. In fact, there's uh, Sterling Energy plants now that are going up with these satellite dishes, these types of dishes, although much more simplified, that are using helium. Yeah. They they do that in the parabolic trough or or where you have a, a vacuum tube where you have the focal point, so a heat transfer tube. You can have heat transfer fluid. Some of them use you know Dow Therm. Some of them use steam, you know heavy water or something like that. But yeah, the oil in that case ends up being the heat transfer fluid, which is cool. But every everything has its drawbacks, right? So. <clears throat> Uh, this is just another Sun Edison project. So I just kind of want to end here. Um, the importance of renewables, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know the jobs in 2010, um, a plus absolute change in jobs of uh, 12,000 plus jobs, and and 10.7 uh, percent. You know, what we're seeing here in our economy <clears throat> is that this is a job generator and that, and I know that you folks are depending on it, but we in our company, I mean, we're very aggressively pursuing these projects and we're employing a lot of people. You know, we probably have, at Morrison, we have about 2,400 full-time people. In our renewable energy group, we have 350. But in a renewable energy group, we also have, plus that 200, 350, we have over 2,000 craft workers on our projects at all times. And that's a great economic engine, you know, for every project that we work on, every community we work in. So, and then the last thing I want to show you <clears throat> is just the mapping solar growth in the U.S. Um, I would encourage all of you, because you're in, in my field and you're in my field, we're in this together. Green Tech Media is probably the best place for getting research data. So if you keep that on your site, Green Tech Media and Green Tech Research, I know the people there, they're legit and they dig deep and they find the, the best data. And, and if, you, if you really want to figure out what's going on in the industry, you know, you can save yourself a lot of headaches and go to a reputable source. Well, Green Tech predicts the growth of solar, and you can see by the size of the, the little balls, each one of them is a gigawatt or 1,000 megawatts. And you can see where they're predicting <clears throat> the size of solar to go. And, and um, it's not that they're never wrong, but they're mostly right. So, okay, that's all I have. If you have any more questions, be happy to answer them. Here, yes. We have not installed any energy storage yet, but we are actively bidding on two projects right now. Um, they're both battery storage, and but one of them is looking at, at an al alternate storage of compressed air. Is the compressed air somehow combined with the turbine? No, it's combined with a, um, a combined cycle gas engine, yeah, so right. gas yeah. Turbine. Gas turbine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that using the existing mine? Compressed air or is it tanks? No, no, this is this would be uh, this would be new. The the existing mines are like the salt domes down in Arizona. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that that's taken off much. With your compressed air storage, you you gotta find an existing natural gas mine, don't you? Well, I can't say right now because I don't know how they're gonna configure it. Regarding storage, um, your wind generation profile is more efficient at night, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, have, how do you um, change the, you know, the supply side of it? Or, do you, or is this why you're getting into storage, or do you currently use other storage <coughs> methods? I know um, Daryl worked with batteries now. I think, uh, have you other used other methods as well? We're, we're looking into different types of battery storage. Um, for both solar and wind, but the the actual decision doesn't rest with us. It rests with our partners, the developers of the projects or the owners of the project. So they would come to us and they would ask us, what do you think? 
And so we have to educate ourselves on what's out there in the marketplace on what it's going to take to build it. And, and so that's kind of the process we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jack. Um, on a lot of these, do you get involved in the finance side? Do you know if there is kind of an idea of a lot of the funds for these projects, are they domestic funds or do we have outside capital coming? Um, I, I would say the majority of the projects in renewable energy that we see are, are, are funded domestically. Um, but I, I have every week, I guarantee you three to five times a week, I get approached with uh, companies overseas that are trying to get into the U.S. market. And they usually bring bags of money. So I, I have no doubt that there's different sources of funding that will be coming in to these projects from all over the world. You know, we have, we have companies that are moving away from Western Europe and moving their entire operations to San Francisco because of the opportunity here. And then South America, of course, you've been reading, there are lots of opportunities in Chile and Peru and in South Africa. You know, there's lots of places around the globe. And so they're kind of leaving Western Europe and going to some of these other locations. But we're a destination for, for these renewable developers and financiers. Yes. I've heard a lot of things on the presidential bank about being independent. What are you saying as being a, a player in the utility and solar business? Uh, is the government helping? Are they really, are they really trying to aim at this goal of being energy independent from renewables, or is this malarkey? Well, it's not malarkey, but it's a small percentage of our overall energy contribution at this point. Sure. So I think. Um, it's imperative that our government supports innovative technologies, and energy is one of those. Renewables is right in that sweet spot. What we all have to look at, though, is you know we know that energy consumption is going to increase, but we also have to say where are the incentives coming from? And the states have, have been incented to meet a repo their renewable portfolio standards where the utilities have to get a certain percentage of their energy from renewable sources. Well, in California, for instance, their portfolios are filling up. So they don't have to get any more renewable energy per se onto their grid. So where's the next incentive coming from? And I think we talked about it early on. That incentive is going to come down for prices being low enough that they're going to stand on their own to be a good deal to a utility, a commercial, or a residential buyer. And that's where I see it going. It'll take a while. And government needs to help getting there. But I think in time, we'll see, will it be a standalone technology that will be able to sell itself in the market? Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier on that um, Mortensen was looking at the commercial mm -hmm. uh, rooftop spaces that I assume you were talking about. And I wonder you know, what thought process you're going through right now, because it's clear that across the country, um, there are enormous, uh, there's a, what, a gigawatt and a half of solar rooftop uh, projects that are going forward in California, PG&E, uh, SC, uh, San Diego, Gas and Electric. Um, each of those is in the range of 500 megawatts, and they're almost all on rooftop uh, in inland space. So um, I'm assuming that that seen as a, a value we we think that for the next three or four years, utility PPAs that are already in existence are going to be built out from the utility scale, and we're trying to be prepared to do the utility projects. Moving forward after that, the distributed generation type of projects behind the fence, ground mount or or whatever, are going to be the projects in the 10 to 20 megawatt range that are going to be needing to be built whether they're on rooftops or ground mounts or, or carports or elevated arrays. So what we want to do is we want to, I'm not going to charge you for that. <laughs> just making fun. That's what we see. And I, I just think that we need to be aware and ready when it happens. So that's where I think the, the market's going. 
isn't Walmart already that? Yeah. Like Walmart, Kohl's, Costco, um, several of the big box guys have done a lot of that work, and you guys probably know more about that than me. But it, yes. Right, we have. Uh, I, I think the investment tax credit, it's online to state to the end of 2016 for solar at a 30%. And then after that, it's looking to ramp down to 10% from then on. But, you know, that could, be, uh, that could be changed too. But as far as I can tell, that's probably what we're, we're going to be playing with until 16. One more question, Charlie. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Good, good I, I do. I want to. I want to just say that this this company is a real gem in Minnesota, and I'm working from the inside. And what happens out on a construction site starts, you know, right at the top. And and it's just been a, a just been a really excellent time there. So thanks everybody. It's been great to talk to you. I'll be around if you want to talk later.